Today on Couple of Pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have George Kudanaris from B2B Playbook, co-host of the B2B Playbook. Welcome. Thank you, Ricky. Very glad to be here. I actually just sent a podcast I was on the other day to my parents last night, so good to have another one here <laughs> so I can keep proving to them that I actually am doing something every day. Yeah, you didn't become an accountant, so you'll always be a disappointment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Accountant, a lawyer, yeah. doctor, whatever. Yeah. A marketer, you might as well be unemployed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. So I'll tell you why I got you on here today. I've come across your B2B playbook. I've listened to some of the podcast episodes and it's not like anything I've heard before. Now, I, there's a lot of people out there, I don't know, selling expertise, peddling rubbish. Yours seemed like a genuinely methodical process to build a relevant marketing program. Tell me a bit about it. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say. My business partner and I, Kevin, we basically built the B2B playbook because it was the resource that we wish that we had when we really got deep into the B2B world. Quick background was we were both lawyers and then we were both in B2C marketing at an agency together. We went to the B2B world and we were trying to get really deep into it. We could only find really disparate parts of strategy mm -hmm. hacks. So we thought, you know what, we've got to go out there. We're going to go and learn from the best and once we did that, we tested that in our clients and we found what we had was a really actionable strategy that could take you end to end for what you should do and when. And uh, that's called the B2B playbook. We've packaged it up in our 5Bs framework, which is the framework you need to follow yeah, to do we'll it. We'll get into that and we're soon. Releasing it, and we're releasing it step by step every episode on the B2B playbook podcast. Amazing. So essentially, they don't have to sign up for your course. They can just listen to your podcast and, and DIY it if they so desire. Yeah, that's right. Look, I think we probably give away 60 to 70% of everything for free on the podcast. If people want to go and work their way through it, take really diligent notes, that's what it's there for. We're there to make B2B marketers' lives better. So go there and take it. Amazing. I think I need to do it because what we've done at the, in the meantime is like you mentioned, all these hacks. You find one tactic, you find one thing. Oh, we need to do a website. You build a website. But that's when I refer to in sales, like that's just a feature. That's just a tactic. It's not a process or a system. That's right. That, that, that's exactly what it is. And what marketers are really lacking is they're lacking a holistic long-term demand creation strategy. So how can we take, how can we create a long-term B2B strategy that creates a brand that people love, want to buy from and advocate for? And um, we show marketers not just how to do that, but how to do it in a way that they can see is actually having an impact on a business's bottom line. I joked earlier, Ricky, that mm. my parents don't really respect what we do as marketers because <laughs> we're not a lawyer, accountant, or a doctor. I think marketers absolutely should be taken far more seriously because we serve functions within a business that no one else is really positioned better to do. Yeah. And so part of the framework is bringing that back and showing people how to do it. Yeah, I get that. Now, a few quick questions. This is going to determine which half of the audience turns off now and which half sits forwards in this seats did you ever watch that mtv celebrity death match no i didn't okay. i'm so sorry <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> and maybe i'm just showing my age <laughs> wait what, what, what explain it to me maybe i've forgotten the title they had these the clay figurines almost stop motion of different celebrities in like a wwe wwf style fight that always just went to the death and they're using it like, anyway don't know why i brought it up maybe i should have prepared better but sales and marketing in a fight who wins oh gee i think hmm. sales win Every right. time, actually, our audience uh, is going to like this. I don't want to. No, I don't want to know why. I don't want to know why okay. because that's when we're going to get into some some territories where I'm going to have to edit this podcast a lot and post, and I just want to by all means avoid that. All right. <laughs> so, sales winning in a fight. All right. Your friends are my friends now, and everyone's going to like you. The other one is outbound outbound calling. Where do you typically see it in organizations under sales or under marketing? I typically see that under sales, but I think there needs to be like a joint plan with marketing so we can turn some of that cold outbound into warmer outbound. Great. All right, George, we can be friends. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually see it under marketing. I like, I'm pushing it as much as I can towards marketing. Um, yep. Is that because no one wants to do it? Or <laughs> <laughs> It's because market, marketing has all the budget. No, it's, I think when people are calling, particularly early stage companies, they don't have their marketing their messaging right and you testing that messaging so you're going out with a call script who's responsible for how brand and a company is communicated through to prospects that's marketing's role is for controlling that narrative what about the objections that are coming back that can also feed marketing in terms of how do we position this relative to the rest of the market relative to people's priorities what about the features requests that people are talking about and asking for firstly that should go back to product but that's also then about 
what maybe needs to be highlighted from a marketing perspective. Outbound in my mind is just marketing. It's only reason it's in sales is that it's servicing sales department, which very often sales is, I mean, marketing is anyway, but sales is a part of marketing and that the career progression of an SDR is often through into sales. But other than that, it's a marketing job. Yeah, look, I think I do agree with you there that the insights that you get, particularly that early stage are incredibly valuable for marketing. Marketing should be the ones who help you with that positioning, the messaging to go along with it. I think it really highlights very clearly the need for sales and marketing to work very closely together, and perhaps break down some of those existing barriers between the two. I think one of the huge issues that you touched on there is it's sales who are doing that outreach. They're the ones who are gathering that information qualitatively because they're speaking to the customers and then that information is getting siloed. Yeah. So whoever's doing it, it needs to get passed back to marketing. 100%. Now, cups that come to you what's probably the biggest mistake they're making before before they find you yeah look a lot before they find us they're really operating very heavily in what we would call that demand capture space if you look at the total market of 100 percent of people who could buy from you they typically operate in that three to five percent of people who are ready to buy right mm -hmm. now that absolutely helps them in that initial phase of growth if you're a younger company and that's typically operating with direct response ads in social mm -hmm. or in places like google ads so you're capturing people who are ready to buy right now a lot of them their issue is they don't know how to then actually scale beyond that and start looking at that 95% of people who aren't ready to buy from you right now, but you could, that they could buy from you. Yeah. And so we teach them how to focus on that 95%, how to create education programs that build affinity with that 95%. So you lead them from the logical conclusion that I've never even, I was never even aware that I have this problem that your company solves to going all the way through to you guys are the perfect solution for me. Brilliant. And that makes a lot of sense because that 95% is where that real value is. And a lot of the skills and tactics that you can learn on just about how to capture that initial demand. That's right. That's exactly right. And for it's the reason I think people are out there just capturing demand and only really know how to do that is because most of our marketing information now, like a lot of it comes from tech companies mm -hmm. like Google, Facebook, HubSpot, whoever it might be. And they're mostly teaching that kind of marketing because that serves their interests. Uh, it's us smell know, a conspiracy. It, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think so. And look, I think it's hurting some of them. Good friends with some Facebook reps. And for the longest time, they've been focusing really heavily on the ROI that you can get from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now that all of a sudden it's so much harder to track and attribution is a mess. Facebook have hurt themselves because people are pulling money from the platform because they can't track from click to sale as well as they could before. Mm -hmm. So instead, they should have just been peddling the idea that Facebook is a great place to reach your dream customers, to build affinity with your product. You don't need to see a click to see ROI at the back of it. And I think they've really hurt themselves there. It's so interesting that you say that. We're saying the same with cold outbound, that cold outbound is primarily driving your midterm outcomes not just the short-term outcomes because outbounds leading to inbounds later down the line and conversations started now become customers in six months or a year. So you're just part of that marketing cycle of creating awareness. That's right. That's right. That's very interesting. Exactly. It's just another way of generating awareness. And sometimes, to be honest, Ricky, I don't really do much outbound at all. I don't have much to do with it. But I imagine when it's done, it's done in a, in a uh, much more targeted, helpful way. So you're doing it with the goal of building those relationships. I think we have a tendency of marketers to lean very heavily on tools and do a whole lot of spray and pray because we can just throw ad dollars behind something and try and reach a bunch of people with a message that doesn't really resonate. But when you're running outbound, I imagine that you can do that in a far more effective manner. Yeah, I'd agree. Of course I would. Now, what percentage of people with marketing in their job title could accurately articulate the difference between marketing and branding? I'm just taking a step, I, yeah. <laughs> you know what? There are so many definitions that are, that are being thrown around and there's so much distinction between different kinds of marketing. Mm -hmm. And look, part of what we talk about is we say, yes, we teach demand generation, but demand generation is really just part of a good, holistic, sustainable marketing strategy. And so the boundaries between those things, I don't know if they're quite as necessary and needed as people want them to be, particularly in the space that we play in, right? Like we're playing in marketing teams with five or less. Like at that point, who cares about the difference between marketing and branding? You should all be having quite a similar goal. As that marketing team evolves, then you can start to section off different responsibilities of marketing. But for me, I, I don't, to be honest, Ricky, I don't see a, a huge difference between them when you're at a smaller stage. I love that answer. And we're seeing even 
SDRs, part of the sales team, doing personal branding exercises supported by marketing as part of demand generation. It's all getting mixed in now yeah. and it's exciting. It's exciting, but it does require more education, more capabilities, more holistic strategies to be running yeah. and permeating through all departments. Totally. So talk to me about your course now. Is it 12 weeks, 12 parts? Yeah, that's right. It's 12 weeks. So it's called the B2B Incubator. And so for those who believe in our 5Bs framework, it's a way of them actually implementing that in their business over a 12 week period. So we give people the strategy, the templates, the tools to go ahead and implement it with nine other similar marketers and they go through and do it together. Yeah, we walk them through step-by-step step exactly how to create and implement a sustainable B2B marketing program. And you mentioned they do that with nine other people. So do they get a bit of a cohort out of this? Yeah, that's right. So it's a cohort approach. And the reason that we wanted to do that was, look, we understand that there's so much nuance to what everyone does, yeah. right? Like we give people a strategy. Yes, we give them the templates and the tools, but every business is slightly different. And so I think when it comes to the implementation of that strategy within a business that's going to be slightly different from one business to another and so we thought the cohort approach was a fantastic way for these marketers to actually be learning and implementing together from each other yeah that makes it so much easier it's being able to check the answer sheets of the person writing the test next to you doesn't mean that they yeah. know the right answer either <laughs> But just seeing how everyone around you is answering that that question. Right. And look, parts of the program is doing like a lot of fundamental things that marketers should all be doing, but they don't want to do because we always revert to leaning on the sexy tech or running ads or running tests, but we don't do a lot of the fundamental work, like deeply understanding customers, learning how to create scalable, helpful content programs, using paid media in a smart, efficient way. So when people do this in a cohort and they see other people in their cohort going, oh, I actually interviewed three dream customers today and here are the answers and insights I got from it. They go, oh, Dan, this actually works. I should go and do that. Yeah, that's brilliant. And at the end of the 12 weeks, you don't just have knowledge and 12 video webinars that you're never going to rewatch. You practically have program like you've built something. That's exactly right. So every week there's activities that you need to do and they're not activities for the sake of going through something theoretical. It's activities that you should be doing in your business. And so you document that at every point. So at the end of the program, you're left with a three-part document, which really is your plan for creating demand. And you should be then implementing that over at least the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. I, it's great that I just completed a course over in the US that I couldn't attend because it was the hours were incompatible with human life in Australia. And <laughs> so they just sent the webinars. So it was a six part, six week course and I've got a certificate. I never attended any classes and I haven't even watched the recordings. <laughs> what are you doing with the certificate? I was thinking about sending out certificates for the B2B incubator, yeah. but I don't know if that undermines the whole no, thing. No, they're certificates, I really, I they're fucking marketing plan. It. Here's a proper plan. I'm going to get paid for the next year <laughs> because of it. The certificate is the check that you get in the mail, or not in the mail, the money you get deposited in your bank account every fortnight, every month for your salary. That's the certificate, like some tuckless practical benefits yeah yeah no that that's right that's why i haven't gone and issued certificates yet but i don't know i don't know ricky some people still want that certificate at the end of the day as well it's something to consider i think consider. i think you should consider that as part of your marketing plan what does your market want yeah that's exactly right that's exactly right at the end of the day i've, I've got to cater to them and we do really seem to have niched down into b2b marketing managers mm -hmm who are in that first one to two years of being a B2B marketing manager. Because all of a sudden, whether they're doing it alone or they're starting to develop a little bit of a team, this marketing plan becomes so vital. Yeah. And learning how to report on that plan becomes incredibly vital. So they're the people who I'm listening to. But off the top of your head, what are the five Bs? Yeah, so the five Bs are be ready, be helpful, be seen, be better, and be the best. Do you want a, a one-liner for each of those? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So be ready is all about how to deeply understand your customers. Be helpful is about how to build relationships through helpful and educational content programs. Be seen is about how to amplify and scale those relationships and then start to close some demand with account-based marketing. Mm -hmm. Be better, which we're just getting into the podcast now, is about how to optimize the first one to three Bs. And then be the best is looking at strategies and tactics that are used by normally the big end of town. So how to use things like neuromarketing and use it to your advantage as a smaller business. <laughs> All right. I'm excited for level five. Could you just give me a one-liner? What the fuck is neuromarketing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> neuromarketing is it's basically learning to manipulate people's brains and brain chemistry to get the outcome that you want. 
So it's whenever you step into a supermarket, the reason that everything is laid out the way it is all probably based on your marketing principles. It's the reason why you come out and you've bought a whole lot more stuff than you planned on buying. Okay. And I get the concept. I just hadn't heard the term, yeah. but I'm not a marketer. And that's, I'm, that's <laughs> it's super interesting, right? Because we do these things all the time. We might not just be, there's companies like the big social media groups that have real experts that are studying these things. They're funding studies for these things. And if you could adopt some of their learnings into your small little business, it could make a huge difference. And look, it definitely can, but there's a reason why it's the fifth and final B. We've really weighted them in order of what you should do them in. There's no point in doing that if you haven't made your way through those first three fundamental Bs. Mm -hmm. Because be better and be the best, they're the things that are getting you the 2-3% incremental improvements. And if you don't have a really strong base, then a 2-3% uplift on that base isn't really going to be doing much. So that's why that comes right at the end of the framework. That, make, that makes so much sense. Your program, international, do you think there's geography that makes a difference, culture makes a huge difference, or is it some universal principles? No, I think they're universal principles, really. And we've had people go through from the US, Canada, and India. We've had applications from the UK as well. The UK is tricky because the time zone, Ricky, is so damn awful. Yeah for us over here there's just there's literally no good time no and i've got to, I've, i'm up at six in the morning meeting meeting with the east coast then eight o'clock with the west coast and then seven eight at night i'm starting the uk yeah it's wild uh, that the uk i think is the biggest challenge yeah. time zone wise but i think we've managed to have some international appeal and we haven't deliberately done that at all to be honest we've been really trying to double down on the australian market and we have got interest in people going through from australia but it really seems to be internationals that i think are probably the least effort for us i think business is so hard and fast in countries like the u.s there's a need to succeed a lot quicker and programs like yours 12 weeks get your strategy done couldn't really do it yourself any quicker unless you were already seasoned experienced you've run your team of 20 30 you've built three or four marketing programs like this failed on two of them then you could do it yourself but if you're not in that position if you want to get it right first time you're going to need someone who's done it tens of times before to give you the give you the roadmap that's right and look as you said who has the time to sit down and do this themselves. It it took us such a long time to put this together. We have digested so much information. We have tested this so many times ourselves. And when you read through what the contents of the program are, it's not rocket science, Ricky. Yeah, it all makes a lot of sense. But we, yeah, we've done that hard work for you. And we've pointed, put it in something that's that is that shows you how to do it step by step and gives you those tools to actually do it. So as we say, you know what, you can go through, listen to the B2B playbook and you can take notes for 60, 70 episodes. You can go through and try and figure it out yourself or you can pay a pretty nominal fee and come through our program and do it with a bunch of other marketers. It's There's a reason statistically people who hire personal trainers have greater success. And I don't necessarily think it's only because of the expertise of the personal trainer but that you are committing to a program. Yeah. That's right. And that is some of the feedback that we've had from the program is, but for the fact that we had, because we have live consultations where the group comes together every two weeks. If we didn't have that, some of them said, you know what, we actually might not have got through that content, but they actually felt the pressure to go through, yeah. watch that content, implement at least parts of it. So when they turn up to those live sessions, they actually had yeah. something to say. I'm on a couple of board meetings and I can tell you now, 48 hours before a board meeting is where 90% of action items from the previous board meeting get done. <laughs> a reminder goes out, hey everyone, see you Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. And uh, that goes out on Monday morning. Monday, Tuesday, the work gets done because nobody wants to come on Wednesday saying, sorry guys, I've let, I've let everyone down and I didn't get to my action item. We're all on the board, we're professionals, we're never gonna do that. Those two days. So if it wasn't for that board meeting, it would easily push out, easily. That's amazing. Yeah. And look, I'm not a huge fan of email automation mm. generally. There's not many things I automate when it comes to communication, but just simple reminders like that. My God, I'm so glad that we have <laughs> some email automation tools to schedule and things like that and make sure people keep up to date. If you're not a fan of email marketing, I've, you've just given me a challenge because I need it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Right? 
Gerard. <laughs> Tell me. If I could get you in the inbox, definitely in the inbox, not in the spam, not in promotions, in the inbox of any single person that you wanted to talk to, you could control the message. You determine what that message says, how long it is, what the message is. But if I put that message in front of them to say there's a 80% chance they're going to read it. Yeah. Surely that's a challenge you'd accept. It's like, I think I could turn some of that into revenue or into conversations at least that eventually turn into revenue. I totally understand what you're saying and I know it can definitely work. I think when it's your own product in your own business, I'm Ricky, I'm constantly terrified of that first interaction being one that wasn't solicited by that other person and that being a negative experience for them. That's so interesting. Uh, and I think that's the difference. One of the differences between a role that a salesperson is comfortable doing right because that's always our job like cold calling we professional interrupters what we hey did i get you at a bad time like that their burrito was on their way to their mouth before they answered the phone it's always yeah. a fucking bad time to get a cold yeah yet it generates billions of dollars worldwide can you challenge me on that though like why shouldn't i feel that way why like, why shouldn't i feel that like i for me i feel doing cold outbound i'm scared of that first interaction being one as i said that i feel like that other person might not want to have even if they okay. like really tightly within my icp and i know that i have a program that can help them but i still feel bad about landing in those people's inboxes i want you to why so that. first of all they don't care about you and they don't know who you are and you can't care <laughs> yeah. about random people's opinions that's the first thing second thing you can look yep. at anyone from like winston churchill or any of the greats that would say if you're not pissing off a certain percentage of people you're not actually doing anything meaningful you have to be willing to push some boundaries and these days you need to have like your fans and your detractors but just to be blah and in the middle isn't a winning formula so you can push some people thirdly i'd say what's wrong with interrupting someone if you're walking down the streets and you saw someone uh, you needed the time would you feel uncomfortable stopping someone saying sorry do you have the time for me or excuse me could you point me in the direction of central station would you feel bad doing that no that'd be okay. so you're happy to stop someone interrupt them and ask them to help you but you're not happy to stop someone, interrupt them and ask if you can help them. That's a good point. But That's a good it, point. It's barriers I, we've put up that are not helpful yeah. to ourselves. I think something you mentioned there is really interesting was the like no one cares about you and i think that's absolutely true and the longer i've been in business and doing this the more i realize no one really cares about you we all suffer from the spotlight effect where you, everyone just thinks that their life is under this great spotlight on stage and everyone's watching you the reality is no one gives a shit about you at yeah. all like they, they just don't yeah. i i think maybe also part of it ricky is to be quite honest we haven't included outbound explicitly as part <clears throat> of our 5 Bs framework and everything that we're doing, I'm trying to remain, remain extremely true to our 5 Bs framework, but I, there's absolutely a place for it. There is absolutely a place for it. So I would love to learn more about it from someone like yourself, get you on the podcast and find a place for it in our framework because I, I do think it is absolutely very valid way to- Super useful to for the right reach. stage at the right time. Early stage for sure, huge value. You can even help refine your message, which ultimately lands up increasing your return on ad spend just because you're gaining more insights from that first, your first one where you got to know your market. So you can yep. use it in different ways at different stages of your B. I don't think it changes your 5Bs framework. I really just think it's a, maybe a tactic to help implement some of the struct strategies that you'd already be doing potentially through a different way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I think that's very fair. Yeah. It is a great way of getting feedback on your UVPs, help you adjust your positioning. No, I do see that. I would absolutely love to learn more about your process and um, I, mate, how you guys do it. I'll tell you the one nice thing about email. It's not my process. Like email is a universal standard. Everyone has it. Yep. Everyone uses it. It's SMTP. And it really then comes down to the marketing message which is the clever side. Now, before we head off, let's, someone's listening to this. They're pretty curious. They, before I ask how they can get hold of you, let me ask this. What does someone look like right now? And if they do look like that, or they do feel that, or they are experiencing that, it should be a flag for them that they should get hold of you. Yeah. If they're feeling unsure about how they're actually going to create more demand and how their market is going to drive more revenue, for their business in 2023 at a time where purse strings might get a little bit tighter, their ad budgets might be getting a bit cut. We've got a strategy that's going to help you out. That's so clean and so easy. So someone's sitting there thinking, yeah, that's me. I'm a little bit worried. I'd like to do a little bit better. And I've currently been tasked with building a strategy and I'd love to just use this as a tool over the next three months or for your next cohort to build my strategy. 
how do they get hold of you? Yeah, look, I'm always on LinkedIn. So look up George Kudinaris on LinkedIn. If you want to apply for the program, check out the B2B incubator.com. It's a lot more information on it there. Or if you're not ready for that and you want to try and do it yourself, check out the B2B playbook.com where we have all our podcasts. Awesome. Now, just before I let you go, one quick question. How many hours a day do you spend on LinkedIn? Gee, I'd say I'm on it total, probably an hour and a half, I reckon. All right. Aaron, uh, Thank you. I just asked all my guests this because you're doing so well there. And I always look at people that are doing so well thinking, oh, they've got to be spending 12 hours a day. They've no, got to be a full-time job this. Surely. I batch all of my content. It all stems from the podcast. And so I just sit down and write all my LinkedIn posts for the week and a half in the future over an hour or so. Um, every oh, Tuesday. I'm jealous. And then I just jump on and post it. And then the tiring stuff is, the resp- but also the really good stuff is responding to comments and that yeah, kind of thing. Like the building relationships. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like I need a better strategy. <laughs> I need to be better before I can be the best. <laughs> and I'll certainly benefit from, from joining your program. I'll, you'll get my application in the mail. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. We'd love to have you. It's been so good chatting to you. And I'm so excited to just introduce you to my audience or the people who you know I engage with on LinkedIn. So it is, I know how necessary the work that you're doing is because I see how much everyone's just fluttering around, struggling to drive that revenue. And a simple 12-week program that takes you from zero, from go to woe, as they would say in Australia, is exactly what's needed. So I wish you the best of luck and hopefully we can chat again soon. Thanks very much, Rick. He really enjoyed it and very much looking forward to having you on the B2B playbook to talk about Outbound. All right, mate. We'll chat soon. Cheers.